Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very final chapter of The Lost Years of Merlin. Uh, we, it's called Home, and we will finish it up tonight, and then we'll start the book to tomorrow. Um, all right, so in the last chapter, uh, Shim crawled, saved Emerus and Rhea by crawling into the cauldron of death and turning big, and all of the giants came and crumbled the castle. So... Now that that's over with, uh, <laughs> we get to read the last chapter. Okay. Home. The wall behind us started to groan. I turned to Rhea, whose tattered suit of vine still smelled of the forest. We must go before the whole cla castle collapses. She shook some chips of stone from her hair. The stairs are blocked. Should we try to climb down somehow? That would take too long, I replied, leaping to my feet. I know a better way. Cupping my hands around my mouth, I shouted above the din, Shim! Even as a crack split the wall, a face appeared through a hole in the ceiling. The face would have been familiar if only it had been many, many times smaller. I is big now, boomed Shim with pride. You got your wish to be as big as the bigliest tree. I waved to him to bend over. Now put your hand through that hole, will you? We need a ride out of here. Shim grunted, then thrust his immense hand through the hole in the ceiling. The hand came to rest on the floor beside us, though so near to a chasm that only one of us at a time could squeeze past to climb into Shim's palm. Rhea chose to go first. While she carefully worked her way around the chasm, I hefted deeper cut in my hand. Although its silver hilt still felt cold from the clutch of Rita Gower, the twin edges gleamed with a luster that reminded me of moonlight on the rolling surface of the sea. Suddenly, I remembered the treasures of Vinkyra. They too must be saved. Whatever time remained before the final collapse of the castle, I must use to find the treasures that had not already been destroyed by falling debris. Come on, called Rhea, holding onto Shim's thumb. You go first, I answered. Send Shim back for me. As she watched me worriedly, I cupped my hand and shouted toward the ceiling. All right, Shim, lift! As Rhea rose through the ceiling, I placed deeper cut on the safest looking slab of stone I could find. Immediately, I began prowling around the remains of the once cavernous hall, crawling over tumbled columns and the corpses of Gullians, dodging falling chunks of stone, stepping over fissures snaking across the floor, I moved as swiftly and carefully as possible. All the while, beyond the groans and crashes of the castle, I could hear the ongoing pounding of the dance of the giants. In short order, I found the flowering harp, with all but a few strings intact, and a glittering orange sphere that I guessed must be the orb of fire. Quickly, I carried them over to Deeper Cut and returned for more. Near the topple red throne, I discovered my own staff, a treasure at least to myself. At the far end of the hall, I uncovered the half-buried collar of dreams, as well as the hoe that Han said could nurture its own seeds. All in all, I found only six of the seven wise tools. After the hoe, I located the plow that tilled its own field, although it proved almost too heavy for me to lift. Then I discovered a hammer, a shovel, and a bucket, whose powers I could only guess. Last of all, I turned up the saw that I, that I knew from Han's description would only cut as much wood as needed. Although part of the handle had been crushed by a huge chunk of stone, the tool remained usable. I had just deposited the saw with the other treasures when Shim's face reappeared through the hole in the ceiling. You must come, he thundered. The castle is readily to fall in. I nodded, though I still wished that I had been able to locate the missing one of the seven wise tools. Not knowing what it might look like had only made my task of finding it more difficult. Even so, as Shim lowered his great hand and I began loading it with the treasures, I occasionally paused to scan the hall for any sign of the seventh wise tool. Is you done yet? Shim bellowed impatiently. Almost. I hurled the last of the objects, my staff, onto his palm. Just one more minute while I climb on. Quickerly, called Shim. You might not have another minute. Indeed, as he spoke, I felt the stones of the floor under my feet shift drastically. I started to climb onto his hand, giving a final glance to the hall. Just then I spotted, in the shadows behind a smashed pillar, something that made my whole body tense. It was not the missing wise tool. It was a hand groping helplessly, the hand of Stangmar. Comes on, Shim implored. I can seize the ceiling about to fall. 
For an instant I hesitated. Then, even as a section of the ceiling came crashing down beside me, I turned and raced across the floor of the floundering castle. The crumbling of the walls, floor, and ceiling seemed to accelerate, as did the chanting and stomping of the giants outside. When I reached Stangmar, I bent over him. He lay, he lay chest down on the floor, the gold circlet still on his brow. A large slab of stone had fallen across his lower back and one of his arms. His hand, now clenched into a fist, had ceased groping. Only his half-open eyes revealed that he was still alive. You, he moaned hoarsely, have you come to watch us die, or do you plan to kill us yourself? I gave my answer by reaching over and gripping the slab. With all my strength, I tried to lift it. Legs trembling, lungs bursting, I felt not even the slightest movement in the stone. As the king realized what I was doing, he eyed me with scorn. So you would save us now to kill us later. I would save you now so you might live, I declared, though the floor beneath us started to sway. Bah! You expect us to believe that? Concentrating hard, I heaved, calling on all the powers within me. Perspiration slid down my brow, stinging my sightless eyes. At last, the, slub, <laughs> the slab budged just a little, though not enough to free Stangmar. Before I could try again, the floor burst open. The two of us tumbled into the darkness below, amidst the rising roar of the castle's final collapse. All at once, something broke our fall. Stangmar and I rolled together in a heap. At first, I had no idea what had caught us, except that it was far softer than stone. Then, as the light from the giant's torches returned, I viewed the ruins of the castle below us, as well as a familiar face above us, and I understood. I catches you, crowed Shim. It's a goodly thing I has two hands. Yes, I replied, sitting in the center of his palm. A goodly thing. The giant's enormous mouth frowned. The wickedly king is with you, he roared with rage. I will eat him. A look of terror filled Stangmar's face. Wait, I cried. Let us imprison him, not kill him. Stangmar gazed at me with astonishment. Shim growled again, scrunching his mountainous nose with displeasure. But he is bad, completely, totally, horribly bad. That may be true, I replied, but he is also my father. I turned and looked into the dark eyes of the man beside me. And there was a time, long ago, when he liked to climb trees, sometimes just to ride out a storm. Stangmar's eyes seemed to soften ever so slightly, as if my words had almost cut as deep as the blade of deeper cut. Then he turned away. Shim set us down on a knoll of dry grass at the edge of the hill where the shrouded castle once stood so formidably. Then he stepped away, the ground shaking under his weight. I watched him sit down, propping his back against the hillside. He stretched his immense arms and gave a loud yawn, though not so loud as the snore that I knew would soon come. Seeing Rhea nearby, I left the crumpled form of Stangmar to join her. She stood looking westward, beyond the castle ruins, toward a faint line of green on the distant horizon. Hearing the crunch of my footsteps, she spun around. Her eyes, wide as ever, seemed to dance. You're safe! I nodded, as are most of the treasures. She smiled something I had not seen her do for some time. Rhea, am I mistaken, or is it growing lighter? You are not mistaken. The shroud is going the same way as the castle and the ghoulians. I pointed toward the giants, who had ceased their chanting and stomping. Singly and in clusters of two or three, they were beginning to drift away from the ruins. Where are they going? To their homes. To their homes, I repeated. Peering across the hillside, we observed what was left of the shrouded castle. While much of it had been crushed in the dance of the giants, a ring of mammoth stones remained standing in a stately circle. Some of the stones stood upright, while others leaned to the side, and still others supported hefty cross pieces. Whether the giants had placed the stones in this fashion, or had simply left them standing, I knew not. In silence, as the first rays of sunlight started piercing the sky above the dark hills, I contemplated this imposing circle. It rose like a great stone henge upon the land. It struck me that this ring of stones would make a lasting monument to the fact that no walls, however sturdy, can forever withstand the power of what is true. Vision that is true. Friendship that is true. Faith that is true. All of a sudden, I realized that I could remember my own childhood in this very place, on this very hill. Only when giants make dance in the hall shall every barrier crumble and fall. 
The prophecy, I now understood, had not only applied to walls of stone. My own inner walls, that had cut me off from my past since the day I washed ashore in Gwynedd, began to crumble along with those of the castle. First in gentle wisps, then in surging waves. Memory after memory came floating back to me. My mother, wrapped in her shawl before a crackling fi fire, telling me the story of Hercules. My father, so confident and strong, leaping aside a black stallion named Ion. The first time I ever tasted the light larkin, the spiral fruit. The first swim in the river unceasing. The final sorrowful minutes before we fled for our lives, my mother and I, praying that the sea might somehow deliver us to safety. And then, from my distant childhood, came the words of a chant called the Lydra. It was a chant that had been sung by my mother long ago, just as it had been sung by the giants themselves today. Talking trees and walking stones, giants are the island's bones. While this land our dance still knows, Baragal crowns Finkaira. Long live, long live, Finkaira. Rhea, I said quietly, I have not yet found my true home, nor am I sure I ever will, but for the first time I think I know where to look. She raised an eyebrow. And where is that? I waved toward the circle of stones, luminous in the swelling rays. All this time I've sought my home as though it could be found somewhere on a map, and now I remember a home that I once knew, here, on this very spot. Yet at the same time, I have the feeling that my true home exists elsewhere. It isn't on a map at all. More likely, it's somewhere inside of myself. Her voice twistful, she added, in the same place that our memories of trouble are found. I reached my hand into my satchel and pulled out the feather. Softly, I stroked its edge with my finger. I have an idea of what happened to him when he vanished. I can't quite believe it, but I can't quite dismiss it either. Rhea studied the feather. I have the same idea, and I think our boss would agree. If it's true, and his bravery opened the door to the other world, then he and Rita Gower must have fallen through that door together. She smiled. It wasn't a, a journey Rita Gower had planned, but it gave us the chance we needed. So if it's true, some trouble is out there so somewhere right now, still soaring. And Rita Gower is out there too, still fuming. She nodded, then her face turned serious. Still, I'm going to miss that hawk. I dropped the feather watching it spin slowly downward into my other hand. So will I. Rhea kicked at the brittle grasp under our feet. And see what else we have lost? This soil is so parched, I wonder whether it will ever come back to life. With a slight grin, I nodded. I already have a plan for that. You do? I think the flowering harp, with its power to coax the spring into being, might be able to help. Of course, I should have remembered. I plan to carry it to every hillside and meadow and stream that has withered, as well as to one particular garden down on the plains where two friends of mine live. Rhea's gray-blue eyes brightened. I was even hoping... What? That you might want to come along. You could help revive the trees. Her bell-like laughter rang out. Whether I come or not, this much is clear. You may not have found your true home, but I think you have found a few friends. I say you're right. She watched me for a moment, and one thing more, you have found your true name. I have? Yes. You remind me of that hawk who once sat on your shoulder. You can be fierce as well as gentle. You grab hold with all your strength and never let go. You see clearly, though not with your eyes. You know when to use your powers. And you can fly. She glanced toward the circle of stones, gleaming like a great necklace in the light, then turned back to me. Your true name ought to be Merlin. You can't be serious. I am. Merlin. I rather liked the name. Not enough to keep it, of course. Though I knew that names sometimes had a strange way of sticking. Merlin. An unusual name, to say the least. And all the more meaningful because of the sorrow and joy it brought to my mind. All right. I shall try it. But only for a while. And that's the end of the book. We read the whole thing. But that's okay, because we have four more. So, tomorrow at 9 p.m. Pacific time, we shall start chapter, no, book two. And I have to find it, and I would tell you the name, but I don't know where it is right now. So, I'll tell you the name tomorrow. You'll be surprised. Okay, have a good night.